You have a tutorial that walks people through the steps of building a device lab. Why are device labs necessary? We found particularly at Etsy, when feature teams are building out new products or new features, there are just some things that you can't find on emulators, and holding a physical device is imperative. You can see all the things, all the usability, all the battery life consumption issues, plenty of things that emulators and just testing your browser can't solve. So we found that building a device lab has helped people realize that there are tons of mobile web users out there on handsets, on tablets, and we're really building for those as well. And what kinds of companies should consider building a device lab? That's a great question. We found that at Etsy, we've got a very large engineering team, and it's imperative that we test on all sorts of devices. More than 50% of our users are using mobile devices on web and apps. So for us, it's very clear. But for other companies, it may be less clear. We found that we started to test on mobile devices as we approached that 50% mark. Around 30%, we started to find it was really important. I'd recommend when companies start to hit that 30% mark, if they haven't already, they should really invest in some sort of device lab, whether it's just a few devices or many devices. And how has the device lab that you created at Etsy changed since you opened it? It has changed in so many ways. Destiny, with whom I'm giving the, the talk and I were just talking about, I think we're on version 3.7 of our device lab. We've continued to iterate on it as we found new ways to make it more usable or add new features to it. Originally, we had just a gray locked cabinet and we never knew what devices were in it or whether they were charged or dead or missing. Then we had a bookshelf solution with stands and devices so people could walk up to it and check stuff out. We could write their name on library cards. And that was sufficient for a while, but then we realized we didn't know which devices had walked away. Some people had forgotten to sign their names out. Things were broken. Things were like not left upright. So it became a lot more harder to manage. We ended up investing in V3, which is like a five degree angle, beautiful set of shelving with which we can you know, do all sorts of things. We can uh, check out devices within our RFID reader. We can make sure our cabling solution, our power management solutions are amazing. It's like infinitely better than it used to be. <laughs> And so what, how do you determine which devices to include? Is it based on some analytics or popularity, something like that? Yeah, we try to cover as many devices as possible with the kinds of things we support. We support above Android, older versions of Android, and more recent versions of iOS. So we definitely want to cover those. We take a look at our analytics and see what our visitors are using, whether it's you know new versions of the Galaxy Note or the Galaxy Tab or iOS 8. And then we also look at other buggier versions of things, so older Androids, Kindles, all sorts of things that have uh, touch and cursor. We try to incorporate those in the lab as well. So you mentioned earlier emulators not really giving you the full picture. What role should software emulators play? That's an interesting question because I think that lots of developers use software emulators as part of their development process. So they'll start building out a new product or feature and use their browser or use an emulator to kind of test it on different platforms. We find that at the very end of the process when they're ready to launch it, it's a great time to step in and use some physical devices. It's also great for user testing. And switching gears, you're writing a book titled Designing for Performance. What are the best ways to get people on board with web optimization and performance? In my experience, it's all about culture. Culture change tends to be the biggest issue with you know, gaining traction in web performance at a company. So you really got to get your very important people, your VIPs, and the people who are your coworkers, designers and developers, to start to care about performance. At Etsy, we've done a number of different things. We've built dashboards to make it clear what our big wins are and celebrate the people who are building out awesome new features and making them super fast. We've also built plenty of alerts so we can see when regressions happen and help people fix them. But most importantly, we found that just getting out there and educating people, showing them the film strip view on web page test, for example, of how slow something is to load or watch them have the video, they can really feel what our users are experiencing when they browse in Singapore or on a 3G network. So kind of a first-hand yeah, take. Yeah, it's all about empathy. Okay. And so just in general, what are you finding interesting or exciting these days and what people projects are you tracking? There are so many interesting things out there, it's kind of hard to pick some. When I was out in Oklahoma a couple of years ago giving a talk at a conference, I met some really amazing web developers out there and saw what amazing community the Midwest has for developers. Amanda Harlan in particular is working on the Techlahoma Foundation, and they're working at supporting user groups and supporting new conferences out there, the way that everybody can have the kind of experience that we have in New York or in San Francisco. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for talking with me today. Thank you.